All right, and thanks for joining me on this episode of the EV Revolution Show. I'm doing this as a video and I'll do it as an audio podcast, so whichever medium you're listening to, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I got a special episode today where it's I've got a special guest. Uh, this guy is a really busy guy, hard to reach. I've got Atlas founder and CEO, Mr. Mark Hanchett. How are you, sir? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being on. Hopefully I pronounced your name right, because I have this thing for butchering <laughs> names all the time. So, <laughs> uh, so I appreciate you taking the time. And, you know, I, I've been watching you guys for a couple of years, probably since 2019, I guess, 2018, 2019, um, when you guys were originally coming out with some concepts and visualizations and the strategy that you were uh, moving forward with at that time. But maybe you could start, Mark, by giving me a little bit of background of the company. I understand this was born out of your garage, this idea. Yeah. In fact, in 2019, we were still in my garage. Mm -hmm. uh, we were in my garage until February of 2020, in fact. Oh, okay. um, so when I started this company, uh, man, it's a really long story, but I'll, I'll try to make it sh short. <laughs> um, it started with this concept and idea of electrification of pickup trucks because no one was doing it. Right. And pickup trucks are, I mean, they're very much so North American. Um, they're very, you know, USA, USA, right? And mm -hmm. Um, a Canada but, too. We follow suit. So yeah, right, absolutely. yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. We have a tremendous number of followers, investors, and reservation holders in Canada. Excellent. Um, and it's it's the fastest growing. It always grows, average mm -hmm. like four four and a half percent per year. The only time it ever dips is when gas prices go above like four fifty a gallon. Right. Um, it's the new family SUV, and no one was doing it. So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. let's start here. And, but I come from a background of sort of, you don't do just one little piece. You, you do one piece very well, but then you do like miniature sort of ecosystem plug-in pieces to give you that whole experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's my background. My background is coming from a completely different technology space, always doing disruption. I've always done things that have literally changed the world um, and always changed the world for the better. Mm -hmm. So when I got into this, it started with pickup trucks and then it was, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I have to solve the battery problem. And if I'm gonna solve the battery problem with electrification, there's this opportunity to focus on a much bigger picture, but you're always sort of selling the sexy, cool thing that you wanna to touch, right? Which is the yes. pickup truck. But our Atlas's sort of mantra, our vision is those three pillars actually. It's the energy pillar, which is charging ecosystem, battery cells, pack solutions, and energy storage. That plugs into a, a platform ecosystem, which is, Everything required to make the vehicle go, minus the sheet metal, the windows, right, the seats. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's the vehicle segment, which we're trying to really remain focused in the work segment. I look at consumer as sexy, and we'll, we'll sell to consumers, but I look at markets that are where you can sort of plug into those different things. So starting Atlas was really focused on trucks. Where could we use trucks? Mm -hmm. What are they meant for? What are the technology pieces that we could pull in? And over the years from 2016 until we really started launching in 2018, 2019, was coming up with that sort of vision is where we want to go. And we have not changed our business strategy since we publicly sort of gone out there and said, this is who we are. Um, mm -hmm. We're an ecosystem technology company. We're launching our energy division today. And then next year, end of next year, we'll be the platform and vehicle divisions. Yeah, you know, and that makes sense, right? You know, kind of build it and they will come approach, you know, having all those different ecosystems to support, you know, uh, the vehicle, which we'll get into. And you mentioned those three pillars of energy, the platform, and then the truck as well on the energy side. Now, you guys are, are different when than some of the other manufacturers that are out there, OEMs, where you've developed your own cell technology, the um, AMV, if I've got that correct, cell technology and PAC. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So, yeah, uh, the AMV cell was sort of born and bred of this mindset of I can't go out and buy something that can one charge quickly, mm -hmm. right? It's sort of those, there's those three hurdles that everybody wants, right? You want to charge faster, you want to go further, you want it to last longer, right? Um, and I knew there was a way to get the first one and second one done. And then the third one is one that sort of came along with it. And when I say the last longer, that's like, how do I get a million miles of cycle? Mm -hmm. right out of the out of a vehicle um, and that plays into our ecosystem approach of course but yeah. the amv cell is a proprietary prismatic cell design it's a cube mm -hmm. um, that is developed leveraging existing chemistry 
So we, we didn't want to go down the science experiment route. Right. Um, it's using existing NMC based chemistry to allow you to charge a cell. Technically we charge the cell in less than nine minutes. So from a vehicle perspective or ownership perspective, it's sort of like from the time you plug in to the time you unplug, it's a total of 15 minute period. And it has to do that every single time. That is the requirement. Mm -hmm. That's where that comes from. So we've developed this cell solution, this mechanical cell, this, this battery cell that's going to go into pack solutions. And that has created a whole business for Atlas. Yes. So um, in this facility, actually, we've got a pilot production line. Um, we're ramping up that capability. We're targeting about half a, a gigawatt hour of output next year, um, where we're producing these cells that are going to go into pack solutions because we developed the whole pack sort of uh, electronic system, power electronics, everything in there. Yep. Um, and that's going to market next year. Excellent. Yeah. You know, I love that approach. And, uh, you know, one of the, the key components to that is, is, as you mentioned, that 15 minute charging. And certainly when you're looking at fleet applications, where you'll have lots of these vehicles, uh, very busy applications, very busy environments, you know, to be able to do that, that quick charge and sustain it for, uh, I think you're talking about 2000 rapid charge cycles, you know, the million mile yeah. duty case, all this kind of stuff. It's got to perform, right? It has to do it every time. And it has mm -hmm. to do it here in Arizona in the summer when it's 120, 130 degrees. Mm -hmm. And it has to do it in Canada when it's negative 40 degrees in the winter. There mm -hmm. cannot be a difference in performance in those two environments, right? From that extreme to this extreme, it has to be consistent all the way across. Exactly. And, and those cells then going into the platform that you mentioned, you created an open modular platform approach, which I think is great because I love when, when mm -hmm. vendors are doing that, you know, so other people can have the ability to take your platform and do what they want. Because as you mentioned, it's not just pickup trucks, right? You guys, you know, you can use your platform for box trucks, uh, dump trucks, um, you know, uh, all kinds of different delivery vans, RVs, EMS vehicles. I mean, the list is long. The and, list you know, is it's, endless. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of vehicles out there that we can electrify with that. Yep. We've got interest in all those sort of vocational, the, the mm -hmm. um, coach builder scenarios that you mentioned, as yeah. well as some that want to do like an SUV. They want to do their own version of a van. They want to do right. their own version of something that's a market that we're not necessarily targeting. Mm -hmm. um, that, But what we think of the platform is the all these different sort of unique um, solutions that are out there, they all operate within that sort of Atlas platform and ecosystem. So think of all those bodies as like an app mm -hmm. that's loaded on top. And it's the foundation is that Atlas platform and ecosystem. Right. And just for viewers and, li and listeners uh, that are tuning into this, you know, when we talk about that 15 minute charging, that's on your proprietary charging system, which uh, if I used uh, an example, you know, a fleet operator would have a couple of those installed at their site so that when the trucks came back, uh, either on a swap or a brake rotation, they could charge them up and off they go again. Uh, yeah. For your typical consumer, if a consumer wants to buy these, you know, you'll support your, um, you know, high speed, ultra, ultra fast uh, CCS. And of course, your level one, level two at home charging. Yeah, we support um, level one, level two. Um, your, your 350 kilowatt DC systems, mm -hmm. and then the AAC or the Atlas advanced charging station. Our plan is to build out a network along highway corridors. So okay. we're not mm -hmm. focused on malls and fast food chain, you know, grocery store locations. Right. Um, we're really trying to focus on more of the, the pull through sort of pull in, you got a trailer attached, right? Maybe mm -hmm. it's a bigger vehicle. You plug in 15 minutes later, you keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and in those locations, of course, we'll support CCS mm -hmm. um, options as well for the rest of the market, right? If we're going to build this infrastructure, let's pull everybody along with us. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that's especially in North America, that's becoming the de facto standard, you know, right. from, uh, you know, next to Tesla standard, I guess that's out there. Uh, so that'll be great because certainly when you're talking short haul and potentially even to medium haul, depending on the size, you know, having those pull throughs are going to be critical to keep them going. Those inner city logistics routes, which there are a ton of them. I mean, you know, the, the sky's the limit really on, on the types of customers you can satisfy with this. Yeah. Our, our current plan is uh, class one up to a class six application, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but we're talking to people in the class seven, class eight uh, markets as well. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, some of the specs that I've gathered from the platform are uh, you're using a lot of um, 
high tech and steer by wire and brake by wire technologies and everything is geared to the four wheels. So you're taking an approach that another organization has taken and putting a motor to the wheel for all mm-hmm. the advantages that you get there from four wheel regen to uh, instantaneous, almost torque vectoring for handling and capabilities. Um, you've got what, 600 plus stated horsepower, 12,000 pound feet, if I've got that or foot pounds of torque, yeah. if I've got that correct, three to 500 mile ranges, depending on the battery pack. Uh, sizes. I mean, these are going to be very capable vehicles to handle a broad spectrum of applications. Yeah, you. if you're going to do this, right, um, now, I have to go back a little bit. Remember when I was talking about how I started the company and mm-hmm. things I've done in the past. I've done disruptive technology introductions into a market where you're introducing sort of either a disruptive solution to something that exists or something new. And if you want to change the world, you, you can't force that integration. You can't force right. people to adopt with something that requires compromise. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to do this, if we're gonna truly do this, we have to build an application, a technology solution that's a massive leap forward. It can't be that leap back. Mm -hmm. And when I think about trucks and I think about work vehicles and I think about the upfit scenarios and those coach builder scenarios, some only go hundred miles a day, Mm -hmm. but some do 200, 300 miles a day. And you don't wanna provide multiple different solutions for those different scenarios for those fleet vendors, because that creates a lot of complexity. And then when I think about fleet owners and I think about not just the ones that go back to a depot, but think about the ones that go from home to the job site and back your, your Mm -hmm. utility companies, your cable companies, your, you know, gas, electric, all that utility infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Those guys sometimes go from like home to the job site and they might go to like a, a warehouse to grab equipment and then they go back out and back in. Mm -hmm. And those scenarios, we can't, force them into electrification and say, listen, you're going to spend an hour to two hours charging. They may not have enough power infrastructure at home to do it. So we've got to provide something that, that works. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we're going to do that, the platform has to be capable. It has to do that. And it's got to be scalable without requiring another billion dollars of development effort, right? To get to that mm-hmm. next iteration of that particular solution. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. It's a great approach, uh, to look at that marketplace and go after that. Um, you have that third pillar that you mentioned as well off the top being the, the actual reveal that happened a couple of weeks ago with the XT pickup truck. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it looks pretty cool. I know it's still uh, in, in early design and it will probably be a little bit different when it finally gets to production. You revealed the alpha prototype. So I spent a lot of time and effort in putting that together, talked about a lot of the, the, the specs and the functionality You know, I love the fact that it is a full size vehicle, you know, capable of seating five to six or sorry, three to six passengers. Um, You've got both a six and a half and an eight foot bed. There's, you know, lots of outlets for connectivity, both what I what I was surprised as well was on the 240 volt size. So you you mentioned about hooking up an arc welder or something like that, which I think is very interesting. (laughs) Yeah, there's a video of me welding in the front of it. Um, And that's drawn right from the vehicle. Right, Um, right. And that's, that's really that work focus, right, mm-hmm. in terms of what we're looking at doing. There's those pieces of equipment that a lot of these guys sometimes haul to the job site that requires a 240-volt system. Um, mm-hmm. The welder is the, the fun and exciting one that, that yeah. a lot of our customers actually ask for. Mm-hmm. Um, so we wanted to make sure we provide full capability independent, both front and rear. So you can actually have someone doing that in the rear and someone doing it in the front, and they're not like trying to share something. It's they can both go full speed on a job site, right? Um, full capability there. Yeah, and another statement that you made on the reveal um, that I wanted to ask you about is that 18 and a half cubic foot uh, front trunk or frunk as it's called. Yeah. Um, you stated that it's the largest in the industry. So uh, I, I haven't I bothered to check the stat, but uh, it is a pretty big uh, area to store stuff in. Yeah, so the, the existing ones, everything that we've seen so far, mm-hmm. right, that's been revealed, we're about mm-hmm. 20 to 25% bigger than the nearest competitor in that space. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it, I mean, if you're going to build a full size pickup truck, let's utilize as much of that space as we possibly can. And there's actually mm-hmm. um, the, the production version that will actually grow mm-hmm. um, a little bit. We, we've got a lot of space that's not yet utilized yet that we can grow that space into. So it's just going to get bigger from there. Mm-hmm. I think we we shoot a video where we we show like five gallon buckets and some you know some big containers and a welder and like all the stuff we shove in there. I think the better metric is we could put three interns in there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, they, they got unwillingly without us, <laughs> like, you know, asking him to do it, of course, but yep. um, it's just going to get bigger. And it, it, that comes back to utility and capability, right? Yes. Um, and it has to be easy. It can't be something that you like lift over something to drop something in. It has to right. be something that you can lift something heavy on and push in. Um, and it's durable enough to handle that in those like dynamic situations of a vehicle. Yeah, I noticed that, you know, the, the easy kind of loading capabilities of that. And, you know, it'll certainly bring a new definition to football tailgate parties. I what do we call yeah. that now? Front gate? I don't know. Well, yeah, front yeah. Front gate party or something. Yeah, something. yeah. That'll be interesting. Throw your Barbie in there and off you go. But, you know, I certainly see the use case for it. And that is correct. You know, you've got a 12 inch uh, ground clearance. You've got active uh, suspension, air suspension. So a lot of capabilities, you know, you mentioned about putting all this stuff and finding more room to, to put even more equipment and gear. Well, your, your carrying capacities, you know, I believe with a 5,000 pound payload and, and up to 35,000 uh, fifth wheel, um, towing capabilities. Uh, I mean, that's, that's again, expanding the capability in that truck for a lot of different applications. Yeah. You, again, it goes back to, you want to target, like if the industry is here, you, you have to be minimum there. Um, and if we're going to displace gas and diesel vehicles, they've set the bar. Yes. So, and they continuously sort of inch that bar up, right? Every single year. So we got to make mm. sure that we're coming out, right? We're, we're taking that next, not just maybe an inch, maybe it's like a six inch step mm. in terms of capability. So the, the XP platform in itself can, um, it's a 10,000 pound per axle rated system. Mm -hmm. So it's like a 20,000 gross vehicle weight rating on the axles themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's, we take that exact same hardware um, and adjust software settings of that dynamic suspension system and everything to sort of work in that class one, which is not nearly that high, all the way to that class five. And then class six, we just tandem axle the rear, right? And you've got a 30,000 gross vehicle weight rated capability. Absolutely, which is great for, for as I said, many, many applications. Um, I'm just trying to read some of the other specs that I wrote down again, that those four independent motors, and that seems to be pretty key, you know, and that's another differentiator when you look at a lot of the other offerings that are going to be in the marketplace where they're going to a single motor axle or potentially dual and a single motor up front type of configuration where again, the, the handling and the, the, um, characteristics. I mean, we're not even talking about off-roading or anything, right? We're talking about work fleets, but I'm sure there's going to be people that are going to want to off-road this thing and it'll be truly capable to do that. Yeah, we're taking a, a very modular approach to everything. So we build a corner and then we just go, you know, control V, you know, control or like, you know, control C, yeah. control V, right? That's just it. cut and paste in each yep. corner. Um, and what that allows us to do is do it with a much smaller team, uh, move much faster. And then as you alluded to, future sort of software upgradable features and capabilities with that, that there, mm -hmm. there's somewhat an endless possibility there. Um, and then we have independent steer in each wheel. We've got independent suspension, independent drive control, independent brakes for each wheel. So um, as a typical scenario, some of the safety requirements are you have to have cascading failure capability in like your brake systems. Right. So we can lose one, two, three, and we still got motor regen in each corner, but we still got a single friction brake that's independent of the other three. Mm -hmm. So you always have that sort of redundant capability in the vehicle in terms of failure, you know, cascading failures, safety, and then capability, because nothing ever breaks down in the shop, right? It always breaks out in the field. That's right. And the other um, uh, element that I picked up in, in, you know, watching you guys, and I am subscribing to the update, so it's fascinating to see the videos coming out. Uh, and I'm glad that you guys are continuing to keep that communication going, because it's pretty important. Um, is, is some of your, your sales type models. So you have, uh, obviously you'll have a traditional sales model for the XT where, you know, uh, consumers and fleets can purchase it through, you know, purchase acquisition, potentially leasing, financing, mm -hmm. those kind of options, uh, which, which is the norm. But, you, but, you know, uh, you've also added the subscription model, which I thought was a brilliant way again for organizations yeah. to look at, you know, providing an OPEX model as opposed to putting really anything from a CapEx up front and doing the switch, right? I, th I think you actually just hit the nail on the head, right? You took that out of my, you know, thing here is like, um, yeah. if you look at the transition to electrification, um, the big CapEx expense that's going to come with that is sometimes insurmountable. Yeah. Um, but if we can make that more of an operational expense, a monthly fee, and it's just one flat fee, similar to this, right? Like mm -hmm. this is my phone. I pay a monthly fee for this. It covers my service, my phone. If it breaks, 
I get it fixed, right? I don't have to worry about anything. The data is mostly mine in this. We won't get into the politics of that, right? But um, this is, you know, essentially the model that we see as the future of this particular industry. And it's not just in the vehicle. You have to tie that to like the service ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You tie it to the charging ecosystem. And then from there, it has to be tied to all those software services that come with it. So when you start thinking fleet management or additional features and capabilities and things like that, it's all tied into that sort of continuously growing, continuously updating ecosystem that these operate in. And, you know, it's a great, uh, as you, you said, it's a great opportunity for clients to get in into electrification. Right. And it's also a great revenue stream for organizations offering it, right? That you know, recurring revenue is a nice model to have Correct. as you're continuing to build out and sell you know, the, the hardware type products as well. Yeah, we see this as a very strategic move for us mm -hmm. um, long-term. Uh, and as we continue to grow as a business and have new product offerings, we'll roll those into that sort of subscription-based model, mm -hmm. which gives you that ability to sort of expand and contract your, um, your own personal product offerings and what you're doing from that particular space. Um, we don't see it as a shared model. I, I want to say that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't believe in the shared model. I think COVID has actually taught us that the shared model <laughs> is fragile. Sure. Um, but, you know, these it is yours, right? You mm -hmm. do what you need with it. And then we provide you with the ability to accomplish that goal, whatever that is. Yeah, absolutely. No, I get it. I think it's a smart move. And uh, again, a great way, the benefits uh, for organizations to electrify, especially those massive fleets and and work horses out there that need that. I think it's a great way for them to get into that. Do you have any sense? Now, I know you haven't come out with a lot of numbers yet. I know, I know folks can, can make reservations, can contact you guys. Um, but do you, you know, beyond, is the fleet your main target market? You know, I know as an example, Lordstown been been very vocal that their endurance is going after the work, right? The, the, the fleet, um, not, they're not really consumer based. Are you, is that your primary target market or are you gonna see yourself as having a good mix of both? We'll have a good mix of both. Now, mm -hmm. our primary sort of focus is building for the work truck industry. Yep. Um, and that's individual buyers and fleet buyers as a whole. Mm -hmm. There isn't much that differentiates them other than who makes the decision. Right. Um, and that's why our business model, like subscription is built the way it is, is because mm -hmm. we look at both scenarios and we look at why does the individual make a decision? Why does a fleet owner make a decision? And how do we bring value across both those categories and how does all that stuff work there? Now, will consumers buy our vehicles? A good chunk of our reservation holders are consumers, but they're mm -hmm. consumers like me, mm -hmm. where I own a diesel pickup truck. Mm -hmm. The only reason you own a diesel pickup truck today is because you, you buy it for the capability. Now, there's some that buy it for, well, they buy it for the capability, <laughs> but it's not for like towing and hauling, right? It's like, I want the big torque of a diesel, right? I want the mileage. I want the, I don't lift it and do whatever. Those are all fantastic, right? Those are all great scenarios. A couple of guys here absolutely do that. Um, but it's important to focus on capability of what the truck can do and understand that consumers will buy it. Individual sort of work truck buyers will, will purchase that vehicle. And some of those guys use it as their daily driver and family vehicle. On, you know, on the weekend, it's the family vehicle. During the week, it's the work vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then you have your fleet buyers. And your fleet buyers are actually a mix of both of those. You have the ones where they come back to the depot at the end of the day. And then you have the ones where they give them the truck and they say, listen, we know you're going to use it for personal use. Yep. Go ahead and do that. Right. And we just, our, our motto is sort of let's provide that solution and mm -hmm. let them fit that how they, they see, you know, as appropriate. Um, now the current uh, stage is in for the company uh, as we're wrapping up this interview. Um, you've got the alpha prototype that's out. Uh, your I guess your time. Do you have any sense of timelines for the next steps, like your beta, your maybe your pilot pre-production, and then getting into production? I think your hope is by the end of next year to get into production. Is that correct? By the I'm a big crawl, walk, run guy. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, when someone says they're getting into production, they're targeting like 10,000, 20,000 vehicles a year. Mm -hmm. Let's do 50 platforms and 150 trucks. Mm -hmm. Let's be realistic. Yeah. Um, so we're targeting that by the end of next year. Um, mm -hmm. If that slips a little bit, Atlas as a business, we've got this complete energy vertical where we're targeting a $300 million opportunity for next year, just in sales and pack solutions. Um, mm -hmm. So from a company stability standpoint, we will hopefully be you know, revenue positive, EBITDA positive next year, 
driven by the energy business. And that money will be funneled into growth of that business. And of course, the XP and XT mark, uh, opportunity. So that's what makes us a little bit unique mm-hmm. in this industry compared to like the others where they're looking at five years, right, to be cash flow positive or five oh, years really? to sell the first. <laughs> I mean, Tesla was, was you know, losing for how many years? Eight years or something? Nine, yeah. 10 years. Yeah, something <laughs> like that, right? It's yeah. sort of on off and now it's positive. Yep. Um, so that's what makes us a little bit different is that we've got an energy group, then the platform group, then the vehicle group. Mm-hmm. Um, the long-term play is much bigger picture, of course. Um, but just to wrap that up, 150 trucks next year, 50 platforms is our target. Uh, we're targeting half a gigawatt hour of sell output next year for customers. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that is just going to continue to grow from there. Excellent. You know, I think that that's, a, again, a smart way of doing things because the uh, you know, you're right. You hear a lot of companies come out with big numbers and then they fall short of those and, uh, right. or, or it's a mad scramble or very hard to get there. And it, because you, you guys gotta, have that other yeah. business. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You ha- you got to build one, you got to build 10, you yeah. got to build 50. Yeah. You can test them all day long and we're going to do that, but you, you got to get them into a customer's hands mm-hmm. and you have to know what's wrong before you try to do 20,000 of them, 30, 40, 50,000 of them. And you don't want to iterate forever until you get to that point and then sell because it could be too late and it takes too much time and the cash burn is way too long. Yeah. Um, we'll learn much faster if we can get 150 out there, make sure they're all safe, right? Make sure all that stuff is appropriate. Um, mm-hmm. We get all the compliance requirements and everything we're supposed to do. Um, but get 150 out there, learn from it. If it's a shit show, then... Mm-hmm. We'll know in 150 and we'll fix that before we do the next 150. We don't yeah. think it's going to be, of course, right? We're very confident in what we're doing, mm-hmm. but that's what you want to find out. Absolutely. No, I get it. Do you see uh, from the initial uh, geography of markets, is North America the original, the initial landscape? And then you may see adoption overseas and other markets as well? So it's interesting you ask that. Um, our primary focus has been North America because that is the largest truck mm-hmm. market, especially full-size trucks. Um, but we do have a contractual commitment to deliver 19,000 full-size trucks to Australia. Um, we've got nice. a partner nice. uh, down there, um, Australian Manufactured Vehicles. Uh, they do right-hand drive uh, existing vehicle applications today. So we're very excited about that partnership. They're going to be our distribution infrastructure partner down there in Australia. Um, large sort of, not it's a really large, really great market opportunity down there that just mm-hmm. hasn't quite been captured yet. They right. sort of played in it, tied into it a little bit. So we're really excited about that. Oh, that's awesome. I had heard that one. So congratulations on that. That's Thank great. You. Um, so again, you know, the world is your oyster basically at some point in time, yeah. but uh, you know, I love the, the process. I love the, uh, the mantra that you guys have taken and, and, you know, the realism that you're bringing to you, know, to what you're doing and that you're going to get it right. It's going to take, it's going to take we're, as long as it takes, yeah, but it'll be there. Parent and everything, right. There aren't many secrets here. So <laughs> exactly. And the initial manufacturing will all be done at the Arizona facility. I take it. Yeah. So this facility actually will be a battery factory. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got to grow to, I think five more facilities beyond this. Wow. Um, and then we'll do initial manufacturing here in Arizona. We'll have partners that are going to do specific pieces though, like body and white will be done somewhere. We've got a frame partner. We'll have, you know, components, yeah. pieces and stuff, but final assembly we've done here. Okay. So om- almost a just in time approach once you really get up to ramp, but. Yeah. That- well, obviously as we sort of grow, you, you start mm-hmm. pulling pieces in. Yeah. Um, but for those first 150, first 10,000, it makes sense to sort of plug in where we can because that's less capital intensive. We can move a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't require those two-year sort of greenfield development programs either. Yeah. Um, so that allows us to move quickly. And then as we grow for the next five years, we've got a plan to sort of pull things in and, and do you know a, a larger scale development effort. And where do you see yourself in five years? I was just going to ask that question. Oh, man, myself personally or... Uh, myself Both, personally, maybe. I'm hoping we're working on the next, like I'm a, I'm a lifer in this, right? So mm-hmm. I've got a, a pretty big vision for where we're going to go. Um, I know the, the steps that we want to take to get there. Um, so in five years, Atlas, just from a, like a measurement perspective, um, we'll be doing, uh, about 75,000 trucks per year of the XT. We'll be launching the next four five and six trucks. 
Um, and then, of course, we'll be looking to the energy business and energy storage business will be a pretty significant chunk of our revenue as we look mm -hmm. to grow there. We'll be doing about 52 gigawatt hours of battery capacity out of the, the battery factory nice. at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're hoping to be at around 50,000 platforms for coach builders per year by mm -hmm. that particular period of time. Those are measurable things that, that we're yeah. targeting. I won't give you revenue numbers at this no. point, but mm -hmm. we'll be cash flow positive very early, um, yes. hopefully by the end of 2022. Uh, yes. And then it's just a growth story from there. Now, where does Atlas go from there? Like I said, I wanna own everything that has worked. So in five years, six years, we'll be doing the four, five, and six trucks, but we'll actually start moving into adjacent verticals within that yeah. particular space. Makes sense, you know, a man with a vision. I love to hear it, I love it. Uh, Mark Hanchet, if I got that again right, CEO and founder of Atlas Motor Vehicles. Uh, people, you can check them out on the web. Uh, I think you're in the final throes of some fundraising, some share option campaign. Just or closed that, it just, yesterday. Just closed it yesterday, yeah. I've been getting yeah. email updates, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just closed that yesterday. That's all going into battery and growth of the team. Great. Um, and then we are on to the next steps, which I can't say anything about. Yep. right now um but things are moving along excellent well you know it's a great story to to hear and to talk to you about again i thank you very much for your time i know you're a busy guy uh and i look forward to getting out to arizona at some point when uh they open the border for us yeah, yeah we're yeah, still yeah. having problems trying to get across yeah, and i think Canada. you're welcome anytime but i think the problem is you're not welcome back right yeah, well that That's could be it. it that could be it yeah. exactly but I will definitely get down to do some uh, some travels uh, when I can, for sure. Uh, uh, you know, I might see you in Austin, maybe. Who knows? I know Fully Charged is looking to do their second outing, uh, which I was part of next time. So we may we may oh. meet there if, if you're part of that. Who knows? But uh, I will definitely try to get down. Yeah. So again, thank you very much for your time, Mark. All the best of success, and I'll continue to monitor your progress. And hopefully, we can uh, resync in in six months or so. And uh, if I do get a chance to get down there, I'd love to see you on the vehicles and chat further. Yeah, look forward to having you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your time, and take care. Take care.